Well, hello. I'm, uh, I'm Jim Weaver. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, JavaFX Bootstrap session. This is my companion, uh, Garrett Grunewald. Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, hey, nice to meet you. Okay, so uh, that's us. Um, we've got a very busy uh, afternoon planned for you. Um, I guarantee you that it's just going to go very fast. Um, the whole objective of this session is to get you up to speed on JavaFX. Um, and maybe you don't know anything about JavaFX APIs. Uh, we want to get you up to speed, show you where resources are, and show you some of the basic, uh, the fundamentals on how to do that. And then point to more, some more advanced stuff. And then we're going to get into some embedded uh, JavaFX in, in that space. So uh, the plan for today then is for the first hour, myself and Garrett are going to go through kind of a jump start and you know, controls and some of the fundamentals there. And then at 12.30, or 2.30, excuse me, one hour from now, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes. And then we're going to invite a bunch of guest speakers up who are going to talk about, they're experts in the areas that, they, um, that they're going to show you. For example, Martin Gunnarsson and Parsico are going to be talking about uh, JavaFX and HTML5 and leveraging those two. Johan Voss is going to talk about data FX and how to, from JavaFX, use libraries to access the back end doing an enterprise application. Johan Voss is going to talk about Scenic View, a, a tool that, uh, that version 1.3 was announced today that allows you to really see what's going on in your, your UI containment hierarchy. Uh, we're not going to have uh, Stephen Chin's talk, uh, but then we're going to show you uh, JavaFX on Raspberry Pi, and then Garrett's going to come back and uh, show you that on the Beagle board, and then we'll have a little bit of wrap-up. I'd like to entertain questions at any point. Um, I, want to, I want to balance two things. One is we've got a lot to show you, so I can't spend a whole lot of time on questions, but I do want to make sure that I'm, uh, that I'm answering any questions that you might have. So please uh, raise your hand. I think uh, a sound guy, Eve, um, if people have questions, can we have a mic around? There's a mic. Okay, good. So um, you know, please raise your hand, shout out a question. And then um, if, the, you know, if the answer gets too long, then I'll probably say, well, let's defer it to the end. Or maybe the question is going to be something we're going to cover anywhere. I'll say, well, let's defer that to a little bit later. Or maybe if it's off topic or going to be too long, I may just say, uh, let's cover that outside. You know, meet me outside, right? So, um, um, so here's a little bit about me. Um, uh, I've been a, a Java developer forever, uh, JavaFX evangelist for the last, ever since JavaFX has come out. Um, I'll spare you my rant, but, um, you know, we took a pretty dangerous uh, and ugly turn in 1995 when suddenly everything had to be on a web client. You know, the web came out, so all these applications had to be on the web. Um, but really, the web was, was made for, to share scientific research. But we somehow shoehorned, we, we force-fit the web into being an application execution environment. The better choice, and what we're getting back to now, is to where the JRE is the client platform of choice, and we're able to run rich clients and develop uh, and have fun again in developing applications. Um, so there's... Uh, got a book that myself, uh, Johan Voss, Stephen Chin, um, and a couple of others wrote uh, for uh, ProJavaFX2. There's my Twitter, uh, Twitter handle there. And uh, tomorrow is my 37th wedding anniversary. My wife is actually in the audience. She's, uh, she's the one right here. So we're celebrating our wedding anniversary in, uh, in Antwerp. So a little bit about Garrett Grunewald. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Gerald Grunwald. I'm coming from Germany, working for Canoe Engineering in Switzerland and mainly focused on doing controls in different technologies like Java Swing, HTML5, but now completely in JavaFX. And uh, yeah, like you, like you said, now with JavaFX2, now this is the, that was the right choice to do it in Java and I really enjoy it. And like you said, it's, it's all about fun. So let's have some fun. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so I work for Oracle, so I have to show you this slide. Basically, it, mean, it means don't make any business decisions on what you hear today. And uh, so JavaFX, what is it? It's actually an API that comes with the JDK. 
So it's already, if you've got Java 7, you've got Java FX because it's an API. It's the successor to Java Swing. One of the most, um, the most prevalent use cases right now for people developing Java FX is that they're porting Swing applications. So they're taking functionality in a Swing application and because of the ability to uh, embed uh, Java FX components and nodes inside of a Swing application, little bit by little bit, they're migrating these applications over to, to Swing applications to Java FX. And also, you know, new applications, creating them in Java FX. It's not the JavaScript language. Um, there was, uh, in 2007, Java, Java FX script came out and it was its own language. It ran on the JVM, but it was on its own language. And so there was a lot of resistance among developers for that. So now it's baked into the API. It's baked into Java. As a matter of fact, to get Java FX, all you do is download Java 7. If you've already got the JDK, then you're done. Um, you can develop using Java FX using uh, your favorite IDE. NetBeans is probably the most approachable right now, but also Eclipse. Um, uh, IntelliJ and uh, Oracle's J Developer. So I wanted to give you some resources. We've, uh, Garrett and I are actually the community leads of a community called JavaFXCommunity.com, and that's uh, here's the the web page for that. And what we've tried to do is kind of centralize and aggregate lots of resources for you. So you've got one place to look as kind of a branching out point. So if you look at this site, over here are a bunch of community resources. Um, over here are a bunch of um, blogs. So we've, uh, virtually everybody that's blogging about Java FX, we're aggregating their feeds here. So this is a good place to get kind of up to the minute news on what people are doing in Java FX. And then we've got some videos here. We've got uh, twi a Twitter feed for uh, hashtag Java FX. And so over here, on this side of it, are lots of resources that I'll, that I'll talk about. Um, getting started, uh, over here is the Java, Java FX downloads link. Um, so you can, uh, you can go there, you can download uh, NetBeans with Java, with JDK. So you might want to, if you decide I'm going to use NetBeans, then just go ahead and download them together if you haven't already downloaded the JDK 7. Um, if you prefer Eclipse, you can go to this site, and this is, there's also a link on that page to this one. It's called EFX Eclipse. A gentleman by the name of Tom, Sh Tom Schindel has done an excellent job in creating an Eclipse um, system or a plugin for Java FX development. You can also download the demos and samples. Those are very helpful, particularly one called the Ensemble Demo. The Ensemble Demo is created by the Java FX engineers to help you, um, to give you examples of all the different controls and and graphical nodes and techniques and things like that in Java FX. So there's um, the ones showing here, for example, are about animation. Um, I'm demonstrating, I, I'm doing this presentation actually on a, on a Windows 8 uh, tablet PC and uh, a gentleman by the name of David, I believe his name is David Chow, I, I can't uh, remember, but he's the Jide guy and he um, ported kind of created a, a version of Ensemble and uh, kind of metroized it, gave it a metro style that I thought would be fun to show you. All that I thought would be fun to show you. So here's, uh, here's that. Okay, make it bigger. I want to make it bigger for you here. There you go. So here are some of the highlights, some of the new controls and, and things. Um, some of the new ones here, like for example, uh, multi-touch. You need that for for tablets. Um, here, the the idea of being able to uh, paginate uh, is baked in to Java FX, and some things like uh, here's um, uh, a candlestick chart, and all of those then have code examples as well as links to the documentation. So it's a great resource to 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 look. Around great resource to, to, to look around and, and uh, as you're a developer to find out 
what you can do with JavaFX, what's available, and then uh, code samples that then you can uh, that you can copy or even create NetBeans projects from. Garrett will be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, Java, uh, the uh, Ensemble is one of the, is the first JavaFX Apple um, application in the Mac App Store. So you could, if you have a Mac, you could go to the Mac App Store and go ahead and download that. One resource that that I'm kind of fond of, fond of is the one that myself, Stephen Chen, Johan Voss, um, Dean Iverson, and Wei Chi Gao created called Pro Java FX2, and we wanted it to be a, a definitive resource for Java FX developers. And you can download all the code samples. Um, as a matter of fact, we've got a we've got a link from this site to this this uh, the home page for the book, and in there it shows how you can download the first chapter of the book, and also how you can download all of the code samples for the book. Those are all for free, and so. Um, the, uh, the first application that I'm going to show you in just a second here is actually from the book, and you'll be able to follow along and, and uh, you know, download that um, after the session. So I'm going to start with basics, creating a user interface. Uh, the example that I'm going to show you is out of the book. It's out of Chapter 2 of the book. It's called Metronome Transition, and it shows a few techniques. One is being able to, to put buttons on a on a scene, um, put the scene on a stage to, to create an application. Also, some things about animation. So first, I'm going to go ahead and run this example. This example. So this is a metronome transition. Go ahead and run it. So notice when I hit the start button that the ball goes back and forth. When I hit the pause button, the ball stops. Hit the resume button, it keeps going. Hit the stop button, then it stops. When I hit the start again, then it, then it goes back and forth. So that's the life cycle of this application. That's the, that's the behavior of this application. So um, I'm going to show you the code for it in some slides, but if you're like me, you, you really distrust slides because you can't compile the code in slides. So I'm going to first show it, you in, you, it to you in the IDE so that you can, so that you've seen it once. I say I'm first going to show it to you in the IDE so you've seen it once. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay. And uh, there, you see it? It's, uh, it? You see a lot of comments there. So now I'm going to show it to you. Um, yeah, there it is. Got a little unresponsive. Okay, so we have um, the, your imports, of course. And then we've got uh, some references to the user interface components that we'll be using. We've got this thing called a translate transition that I'm going to explain to you in a minute got a main method like all good Java applications do. And then we've got a Java FX lifecycle method called start. And in start, we're going to create a scene. We're going to populate the scene graph with all those buttons and things and the circle. And then we're going to do some binding, which is a really cool concept that saves you lots of problems um, and, uh, and is, is something that uh, enables you to be able to uh, synchronize your UI with the state of your application. And then we're going to set the scene into the stage, set the title, and then show the stage. So I'm going to uh, go through the stage. So I'm going to uh, go through that all a little bit slower with you here. First of all, in NetBeans, you would open the application, open the project, and you can get it from the code download. And then we extend application. All JavaFX applications extend a class called uh, javafx.application.application. And then here we're, we've got some buttons that we're um, giving, uh, that we're making, declaring some buttons. Here we're declaring a circle that we're going to use, and we're instantiating it using a builder pattern. And Garrett's going to talk more about builder patterns. Here we're creating this translate transition that, uh, d that does the animation that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. We've got our main method. 
And then, um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to override the start application. It's, an, it's a lifecycle method. So the runtime, when a JavaFX application runs, the runtime calls the start method. And then in the start method, you do what you, what you need it to do. The start method passes in a stage, and, um, and then we're creating a scene here, giving it a dimensions of 400 by 500. And then, in, then we're going to, in the root of the scene, we're going to define a scene graph. And so in that scene graph, we're going to create a group. And in that group, we're going to have a, a button. There's children, a button. And an H box, it's a horizontal box that we're putting the, the buttons in. And then here's each of the buttons, the start button, the pause button. That's where we're defining those. And on the next slide, um, or on this slide, actually, then when somebody clicks the start button, clicks that start button, this anonymous inner class is going to fire, which is going to take this NM, and it's going to run the play from start method. Now, I should have mentioned that uh, during, this, uh, during this session, we're going to be giving away some pro Java FX books. And so um, every once in a while, I'm going to give one away to somebody that's answered a question or maybe asked a, a, a very helpful question. And so I'd like to stop right here and, um, and ask you, um, on this particular anim.playfromstart, do you remember from when we were just going through this, do you remember the name of the class, you know, of what type is the variable anim? Okay, does anybody want to raise their hand and venture a guess? Okay, see a ran hand raised over here? Going to have a mic come over to you? The mic person gets a lot of exercise. Is somebody coming over with a mic? Oh, the mic guy's on the phone. Okay, so... The sound guy is going to get some exercise. And uh, let's see, Garrett, are you going to, or my lovely wife, uh, Julie, is going to deliver a book to you if you get this answer, uh, question right? And what is the answer? That's right. It was a translate transition. It was this guy right here. So that transition that we're going to talk about um, is what's responsible for the animation. But um, that these, these methods that we used here, to play from start to pause to play, that is what causes the translate transition to start and stop, etc. OK, uh, please deliver a book up to this, uh, this gentleman that answered that question. Uh, by the way, three of the authors of this book are in the session today, so if you would like us to sign them afterwards, we could, uh, we could certainly do that. Um, so we're going to animate the circle, and as you've, as you've correctly said, the translate transition is the name of the class. And here we're going to use a builder, a transla translation builder, to create an instance of that class, and this animation, first of all, a translate transition is one that translates from uh, one location, a node from one location on the screen to another location on the screen. So um, here we're going from an X position of zero to an uh, X position of 200. The duration is going to be 100, or 1,000 milliseconds, one second. And the node is going to be that circle. And the interpolation is going to be linear. Interpolation is simply the idea in, in any, like Disney animation, you know, if you've got one state and another state, how do I interpolate between the two? Well, here we're going to interpolate in a linear method, but we could also interpolate, interpolate in an ease in or ease out to where the, uh, it slows or uh, it slows when it starts or slows when it uh, ends. Auto reverse is true, so if we look at this behavior, we see that it's going back and forth. And then the cycle count is indefinite. We see that it's going on forever. And then with all builders, you use a build. Okay. Questions so far on that? Okay, raise your hands if you have questions. Okay, so I have, um, 
I've explained all the behavior for this so far. I've explained why the, button, why the circle is going back and forth. I've explained how we got the buttons here in a nice horizontal row. I've explained how we've put this, the, the frame up there and how we've populated the scene graph. There's one thing I haven't explained. Can anybody tell me, other than the, the gentleman that, that answered the other question, what thing I haven't explained to you? Okay, did, did you raise your hand or were you scratching your ear? Okay, you raised your hand. Uh, microphone, micro, I'm sorry, microphone, Eve. <laughs> It's Eve, you lucky, it's lucky you just had a smoke because... Uh, how, you, how you manage to stop and start the, the motion. Okay, well, how I, okay, how I started uh, to, to start and stop the motion was actually explained here where, where on the start there was an action. Uh, it's anonymous inner class. And then we said and and play for start. But, so we have explained that, I believe. No, I, 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 I meant that when you push the button, start, pause, and release it. Uh huh. Um, well, that's, that behavior is built into the buttons, right? So when I push a button, when I push a button here, it, um, it, it's going to fire that, that on action event, and then it's going to call that the play from start method of the of the translate transition you may be thinking of the correct answer but I'm um, maybe I'm not uh, interpreting it correctly uh, go ahead yeah I was wondering how do you bind the state of the buttons to the animation okay so we're playing jeopardy right so where you're answering my question in the form What's of a question binding? okay so so yes I, I will take that answer um, and if you Matt how do I explain why the state of these buttons, the enabled and disabled state of these buttons, are, are going back, are, are, are happening when I'm clicking the buttons? And that may have been what you meant, I'm not sure. But um, it's right here. It's this binding. So here, the start button, I'm taking this disabled property of the start button, and I'm binding it to the status property of the anim which is the translate transition. So if it's not equal to stopped, stop, then I'm going to disable it. So if it's running, I'm going to disable it. And so this binding behavior, I'm doing it to all four of these. And that is, I don't have to have um, uh, lots of um, like uh, callbacks, things like that, to try to synchronize my UI and my model. It just happens because of the binding. So please give that gentleman a book. Thank you, Julie. So then we finally, we set up and show the stage by setting a scene, um, set the title, and show. OK, now I'm going to cover a topic called the scene builder and a related topic called FXML. So what I showed you here was the ability to procedurally, you know, in code, create a UI. There are easier ways, and some people choose to use Scene Builder. So first of all, I'm going to show you Scene Builder very quickly, just a really quick demo of Scene Builder. Um, so Scene Builder comes up. So Scene Builder comes up. And it should be a pretty familiar paradigm to you, where you've got, um, you've got controls maybe over here. Maybe here we've got a, a border panel. We're going to put it over here. Uh, we've got uh, maybe a button, different user interface controls, so our checkbox. I'm going to put the checkbox in there, maybe put a button in there, that type of thing. And then, um, and then I'm building the user interface, and then I'm going to be able to uh, take a handlers and wire those handlers up to the things in the user interface. So that's, that's the idea. So going back to the presentation slides then, going back to the presentation slides then, uh, the Scene Builder is a UI layout tool. It's also an editor, it's a visual editor for a dialect of XML called FXML. So the FXML expresses the scene graph. 
So as you create, as you use the scene builder, it's saving FXML, it's editing FXML. And then that FXML is then used at runtime to draw the user interface or to express the user interface. So here, uh, if I wanted to use NetBeans to create a, a, an application uh, that I'm going to be using Scene Builder to edit and FXML underneath, then I would say uh, a new project, a JavaFX, JavaFX XML application. And if I were taking, if I were going through these steps, then I would um, give it a project name. Here I'm going to use Metronome Transition FXML, and then an FXML file name, the same thing. And then if I double click on the project tree on the XML file, FXML file, then the scene builder comes up that I just showed you. Now, when I create a default application in NetBeans, it's got a button and it's got a label. So first of all, I want to make it, this, this default application look like my metronome. And by the way, I'll my metronome. And by the way, I'll go ahead and run the metronome project here the metronome translate uh, transition FXML project so that you'll see the behavior and it'll, it'll look very similar. It's just got a little bit of a, a, a different appearance, but the behavior is exactly the same. I, I did it that way so you could tell them apart. So first of all, that's the default application. So the next thing we're Default application. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make it look more like a metronome. So we're going to stretch it a little bit farther. We're going to def remove the default button and label. We're going to drag four buttons. You saw me drag a button. We're going to drag four of those on there. We're going to select them all. And then we're going to, from the menu, we're going to say arrange wrap in H box. And that'll wrap those four buttons in an H box. And then we'll reposition the, the whole H box. So making it look more like the application we want. We'll drag a circle to the stage. We'll, we'll click on the properties and layout inspectors over here to uh, make the circle the way we want it. And then uh, we're going to add, we're going to go into the code, into the controller code in NetBeans that it created for us. And we're going to uh, put FXML annotated things in here sorry, FXML annotated things in here in order to be able to inject those uh, buttons and circles into the controller. And also here, um, we're, we're taking the, um, like the button and we're going to wire it to the controller. So in the, in the scene builder, we're going to say, somebody clicks this button, you're going to call handle start button action. So these annotations then allow you to hook those two together. So uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll populate the controller initialize method. So um, when an FXML application starts up, then there's an initialize. And one of the things that gets passed in is a resource bundle. It's very, very easy to internationalize an FXML application because you just create a resource bundle and it, and it takes care of everything under the covers. And here we're creating our translate transition builder. We're doing our binding. We're setting all that up um, when we initialize. And um, then we're going to uh, click on a button. We're going to give it an FX ID of start button and, um, and the text of start. So we're starting to not only customize this, but also tell it what we're calling it when we created all those annotations. So this is how we're linking the two together, the FXML file and the controller file. And then here we're, we're, we've got the on handler. Remember the handle start button action. Um, here we're selecting that. And this, by the way, when we drop, this contains a drop down of all the handlers that you expressed using the FXML annotation in the source code. And then we're going to mess with the circle, make it smaller. We're, well, we already did that, but we're going to give it an FX ID so that we can refer to it from within the app, so that we can refer to it from within the application. And then finally, we'll run it, and we saw the behavior there. Okay. So, let's see. So, let's see. I started out at 180, 
It's 1.50. That means I've gone for 30 minutes. That means it's Garrett's turn to talk. So here is Garrett again. Yep. It's, uh, here we go. Okay. So let me talk <clears throat> a little bit about uh, custom controls and uh, JavaFX controls in general. Um, oh, let's just switch it on. Yep. First of all, if you would like to know something about the controls in the JavaFX API, you should really take a look at the Ensemble app that uh, Jim already showed, because there it's the best examples you can find. Each control is in there. You can see it working. You can see the code, how to do that. So I would suggest it's the best thing to do it looking in the Ensemble app. You can also get the source code of that. And um, what else? There are some controls still missing that are not in the JavaFX API that you may know from Swing. And uh, some of these are dialogues, for example, or tree table. But uh, this thing is, so to say, uh, under construction. And it will be there with the next release. So uh, don't worry if you don't find it in the ensemble. Just wait a little bit longer and you will get it. Or you can also get it from the uh, JDK 8 builds. So I won't focus on the standard API controls now because we just have limited time. I would like to explain some uh, differences to swing controls. I think most of you know swing controls, right, and how to work with them. And the main difference to, to JavaFX is that you get, for almost each control, you get a builder. And the difference in using them I will show with a little example. It's just this, uh, this little tree view. And uh, as you can see, we have main, two main topics here. It's the animal and the mineral, and some, uh, some items in each topic. So if we create it using it the standard way, right? That means we have some uh, cons using some uh, constructors and then some setters. And then we put it all together. And the interesting part is that we do it by so in the, uh, in the reverse order. So we create all the sub-items first. And at, in the end, we put them all in the tree. Right, you can see it at the bottom. And if you use a builder now, then it would look like this, which is more the declarative way of doing it. So that means we create the main tree first with the main topic animal, then with each of the sub-items, and so on and so on. And at least we, we call build. And then it will create the whole thing. So most of the builders are, or all of them, using this create method first. Then you can set all the, the properties in this control, or whatever you use it for. And at least you have to call build. And then it will create the control. And some of you may now say, OK, yeah, it's just a different way of doing it. But it's very useful, especially if you use, for example, lots of buttons. right? And they share the, some properties or many properties, but some are different. So you can create a builder, which creates the most common parts. And then you use just this builder and add the different stuff that differentiates the controls, right? So it really spares, uh, it saves some, some uh, space in your code, and it makes it more readable. So this is really a good idea to use this. It, it looks a little bit different in the beginning, but I'm really uh, getting used to it, and, and it's really fun to use it. Then, you know, you see, I, I'm really going quick through the points because we have just 30 minutes. So a short look at lambdas. I think most of you heard about that coming in JDK 8. And uh, who of you worked with lambdas already in other languages? OK, so you, some of you know it already. i just give you a short, really short overview what it is. So let's take an example. We have a list, and we would like to loop through each element, and we would get the index of the list too, which is, uh, if you do it in Java, in, in Groovy, this is easy, and also in other languages, like Scala. But in, in Java, you have to do something like that. You can create a for each list. Then you have to create a, a counter, like this is now index, and then count up the index with each uh, iteration over the loop. And then after all, you get the output on the lower left corner. One version. Next version would be just for next loop, right? So it's uh, the same, but now we use uh, the index directly in the, in the loop and get the same output. It's a little bit shorter in this case. So, But wouldn't it be nice to do something like that? Um, 
people who are using Groovy, they know that. It's, it's uh, in there, and I, I guess in Scala it's too. So that means we just have a method. We give uh, to the method, we put the, the list in there, and then uh, there's something like value and index. And you see it just formats the string and then outputs it, and it will give the same result. So is this possible with lambdas? Yes, it is. And therefore, you have to create some methods, of course. Nothing is for free. So you have to create these three met methods to, to realize that in Java 8. By the way, if you would like to use it, you can download the OpenJDK 8 builds, but you have to also download the Lambda builds and then copy it to your uh, Java folder where you have the, the JDK in. Otherwise, it won't work. So in the standard OpenJDK 8 build, you won't get the Lambda support right now, as far as I know. And uh, so there is another, if you use for OpenJDK 8, Lambda, then you will get a different download. It's around 60 megabytes. And it will give you the files you have to exchange. And then you can do this exactly in, a, in an IDE like, uh, I use it in IntelliJ 12 uh, preview, and there you don't get any warnings and all that stuff. They have full support for Java, for JDK 8 with Lambdas. So that means what we do is um, we create first a so-called functional interface which uh, contains only one method. It's here, the, the visit method, and it has an item of type E, and it's the, an integer with index. And this will be implemented by the lambda expression. Then in the second step, we have uh, a method. This is the method we call, after all, this is the each with index. It takes the list, and it takes this item with index visitor of type E, which is the, the interface. And uh, then we have the loop in there, where we just call the visit method. And at least we have this uh, print item, which is just the output of, the, of the, the results. And if we combine all that, then we can really do something like this. And it has the same effect. So that means it's two lines of code, and we have the same result. Um, this only makes sense if you use this very often in your code, of course, because you have to create these three methods. But things like that are possible with JDK8 and lambdas. So, but um, what is uh, about J lambdas and JavaFX? This is a typical JavaFX event handler for a button, for example. You have to create this new event handler or action event and then the handle method. And with the lambda, it looks like this. And that looks much better, right? It's really just button set on action, type action event. And you even can get, you can also remove the action event thing. It's possible. But uh, for readability, readability reasons, I would leave it in. And then you just say, set on action, and then button set. And this is just uh, uh, set the text on a button, clicked or uh, click. Right? But this is a, a simple example of how to use lambdas in, in JDK8, and which makes the code much more readable. So now to my main topic, custom controls. This is what I'm doing most of the times. And they are made of uh, four different uh, things. They are made of a control class, out of a skin class, and a behavior. And we have a CSS file. Because in JavaFX, everything is styled with CSS. So it's not like in Swing, where you have this uh, UI delegates, where you have all this stuff in code. But now you can use a CSS file, like on HTML5 content and you can style your control with CSS. So each control, each custom control, can have its own CSS file. The standard controls will use the so-called Caspian CSS to do that, and for your own control, you have to write your own CSS file. So the control class, uh, it extends control, and uh, this is a, a typical, this is a really simple control class, right? So we have a it extends control. We have something like a def style class where you see a string, it's called my control. And this is in fact the, the CSS class, style class that we would like to use in our CSS file. You will see this later. And then I put in a, a, just a, as an example a double property named value just to have something. And then we have the constructor and in the constructor you see here get style class add and there we add the, this style class to the list of style class. And this is uh, available for each control. That means you can add your own style to a control. 
also after it's, it's running, at runtime, you can change the style by adding just another style sheet or another style class to this control. And then we instantiate here the, the simple double property. Um, in JavaFX, there's also something new. It's the property support, which is, you see here, it's not, not a simple double. It's a double property. And we also say not new double property, but new simple double property, which is a little bit different from Swing, where we just have, for example, a double, and then we would have a getter and a setter, right? That, that's in Swing the case. And in JavaFX, we have the same. We have a getter and we have a setter, and we have an additional method. It's this uh, value property in this case. So that means the, um, the rule for naming it is you have the name of the variable followed by the, name, by the word property. And you will find this all over the place, also in the API. And if you create your own uh, beans, your JavaFX beans, you should use this stuff because these properties makes it possible to bind to your properties, right? So if you don't do it, you can't bind it. So this should be available public. And um, okay, so we have a getter and a setter, and we have this value property method. And on the bottom, we have uh, a method that returns the name of the CSS file for my control. We have in the beginning, we had the, the style class, which was my control. And then here we have the CSS file, which is a my control CSS. Oh, okay. We can do it like this. It's better. Um, so the CSS file. This is a typical CSS file for my control. It's, um, we have one, this is the class we set in the control class, right? It's a my control CSS class. And in this, we have one variable that says fx skin. And this will define the skin class with the full qualified name in the package that should be loaded to visualize the control. I said it's a control, a skin, a behavior, and a CSS. So the control knows which CSS file and which CSS class. In this class, now it finds the link to the skin file. And then I defined another variable. It's just fx my color. And the minus fx minus stuff, this is uh, typical in the current version of the CSS uh, support of JavaFX. I'm not sure if it will be there in JDK 8. Maybe we get, can get rid of it. But at the moment, all the FX-related stuff is, uh, has this minus FX minus prefix. And then I created something like, you see here, my control dot shape. And then I defined a linear gradient. And I derived some colors. And I said the stroke should be also derived from this color on top. This is just an example what a typical CSS file would look like. And in the skin class that we, we saw the link in the CSS, which extends skin base, which is at the public, uh, at the moment it's private API, it will be public in the next version. So the whole creation of um, custom controls will be more easy in the next JDK, in JDK 8. At the moment, it's, uh, you have to know how to do it in the future. I think it will be much easier. I hope so. Because it's sometimes hard to explain. It took me some time to, to get, get it running and understand because it's a little bit different than Swing. But if you know it, it makes sense. So the skin class looks like this. We have a, it extends skin base. It takes a, a control in this case, and uh, it creates the new behavior. There we have the link to the behavior. and. Um, OK, we have an init method. And in this init method, for example, I said I have the value property. And here you see now I can register a change listener like this to this value property in my control class. And um, to react on these changes of the property, I have this method handle control property changed. And in this method, I can react and do something if this uh, value, for example, changes. Then in this case, it should request layout. It means just redraw it. And uh, it will also get, uh, it has a method to get the control in the skin. It has some methods to, for cleaning up if it's disposed and for calculating the, the preferred size, minimum size, maximum size of the control. You should override it and create your own uh, settings for the, for the sizes. 
but it's not needed. So just for playing around, you can just leave it like it is and it will work. But uh, if you really create a control, you should uh, do some intelligent stuff in these methods. And at last, we have a method called layout children. And this method is, uh, in principle, similar to the paint component in Swing. All right, so this is the, the thing in, uh, in JavaFX. And, and you see on the name, you can guess the difference. Paint component will paint something on a canvas where layout children will lay out nodes in the scene graph. Right? So this is really the difference. So Swing handles something like a dead bitmap. And JavaFX has some living nodes in the scene graph. And uh, yeah, I created just a, a method which is, uh, which is called here, draw control, and it will draw a shape. It's a circle. And here you see how to apply a CSS style to this shape. I just get style class and add the shape. And we saw it in the CSS there was something like my control dot shape. And this is now the, the style will now apply to the shape. And then, uh, yeah, instead of using get children clear and at all, you can also directly use set all. This is uh, just the better way to do it. Okay, but what it does is it clears all the children of the current control and adds the things that you have in this list here. In this case, it's just the circle to the, to the node. And then we have at last the behavior class. And you can guess what it, what it means. It extends behavior base, which is private at the moment, will be public in the future. If it's there in the future, I'm not sure. Oh, I, I just saw it's not there in the future, so forget about behavior base. But in the moment, it's, it's there. And uh, it was meant to be uh, the handler for all the events, right? And you see methods like this, they are, you could override something like mouse enter. That means this is in the behavior base somehow. And you can uh, delegate events to the behavior class and handle them for whatever reason you would like to do. Unfortunately, these are all methods that are in there by default. So if you need some other handlers, you have to create them by yourself. And there you can see that it, uh, it looks like, OK, let's do a behavior class. OK, uh, let's get rid of it in the future. So this is, uh, but at the moment, it's the way it is. And now let's. Uh, let me show you a little example because this is uh, much easier to explain. Let's say we would like to create this control. It's a simple LED. We have two states, is it off and on. And it exists because of four, it's made out of four circles. And this is, for example, the frame. And it's made of a circle. It has a linear gradient. And there is no effect at all. It's just uh, translucent, but that's it. And on top of this, we put an off state, which is, it has also a linear gradient. It's hard to see. It's, it's dark red. And it has an inner shadow, even harder to see. But uh, let's keep it like this. And then we have the highlight, very hard to see. It's, that's a, a little bit shiny. It's, again, a circle with a radial gradient. And at least we have the on state. And this is a little bit different because it has not only a linear gradient, it has two effects. It has an inner shadow. And it has a glow. So how to do that in JavaFX? In combination, it would look like this. We, have, we just stack them on top of each other, the frame, the off state, and that's all. And it looks like a LED that is off right. And if I would like to see the on state, I just have to put the on also in there, but just make it invisible and switch it on or off, uh, dependent on the current state. So. You can do this in JavaFX by using three different or two and a half different uh, techniques. So you can use pure code. That's the thing you know from Swing. You can use pure CSS. That means you don't do any coding at all, graphical stuff. Just do CSS styling. Or you can mix it, code and CSS. That's what I mean with two and a half, because it's in principle just a mixture of both. If you use pure code approach, that means our CSS file just contains one line of code. It's just this FX skin. It just leads to the LED skin, right? And in the skin class, then, I created here, I created groups for each of these circles that we saw. And uh, for example, if I take the draw LED on, that means this is now the, the circle that represents the on state. 
then you see the drawing code. And I don't go, on, go to all these uh, things, but you see it's, it's very similar to, to swing code, right? Or any other drawing code. It's just uh, creating shapes, then doing, creating some paints and uh, strokes applied to the shapes, and that's it. And, um, okay, here we create, and this is now, that's the reason why I show it. I said the on state is different because it has an inner shadow and a glow. And um, how to do that in, in JavaFX? We create the inner shadow object, and then we create the drop shadow object. Drop shadow should be the glow, just with the, with the red color instead of, of black. And the important thing is set input. And this is a really nice idea because you can chain effects to each other. That means the first effect is the inner shadow, and then I create the drop shadow and put the inner shadow into it as an input. And then it will overlay both effects on the same shape. And so you can also add some motion blur or whatever on this. And there are lots of effects available in the JavaFX API. And the reason why I mention it is this is only possible in code. In CSS, you can't do it. You can only apply one effect per shape. And I think it's the same in, in CSS that you know from HTML5. That's the same thing. You can only apply one effect on a shape and not multiple effects. I hope that will change in the future. I heard of it. So then we have, um, in a, if we use pure code, that means we have the shapes in code. We create fill and stroke in code, and also the effect chaining is done in code. That means no CSS at all, and it works. This is the easy approach. If you come from a Swing world, created custom controls, you should do this because it's very easy. It's the same as Swing, but most of the standard controls don't do this. They use CSS, and it has advantages. So let's take a look at the CSS approach. Now the CSS file, has uh, it starts with the skin again, and then we have our color definition. It was a red LED, so we define the color red. And then we have, for example, the frame, where I create the gradient, the stroke, the insets, that means the size. And here's something which is very interesting. It's called FX shape. And this is the SVG path. That means you, you take Inkscape, create something, for example, the drawing you saw, just export the SVG, copy the, the path and put it in here, and that's it, and it's in there. And then there's another thing that's called FX scale shape that you can set that to true. That means even if you resize, it will rescale it automatically. And because its vector is always sharp, it's n not, not blurred. So this is very powerful. And with this, we can do the whole stuff. That means we can create the LED off state, we can create the LED on, and on the LED on, you see, Here's the effect, and I only can apply one, that means the drop shadow, that this is the glow. So we don't have any inner shadow here. And we have the highlight, which is uh, the little uh, highlight on the lower, on the upper left corner. So, and the skin class now, you, you guess already, it's, uh, it just contains stack panes, where we have groups before. And in this, this is the, the whole code I need to do that now. I just say, get style class, add, and that's all. I just apply the CSS style to these stack panes, and then they will be styled exactly the way we set it up in the CSS file. No drawing code in, the, in our uh, skin class anymore. Uh, this is a little bit uh, new, I think, to most of you, because if you take a look at the code, you will often find something like that and you don't find something set color, set paint, and all that stuff. It's most of the times it's in the CSS. <clears throat> that means if you use pure CSS, you create the shapes in CSS, the fill and the strokes, and the single effects also. But the problem is we don't have this effect chaining, and that sometimes makes really sense to have that. And so this is the reason why I use at the moment this mixing, which is not very nice, but it gives me what I need, that means I, I will really go quick to that. It's uh, the CSS file, which is in principle the same as the, the one in pure CSS, except the LED on now has no effect anymore. It's just the, the gradient and the stroke. And what we do now is we apply, in the skin class, we apply the, the effect to the, to the glow stack pane. 
That means it will be styled by CSS and afterwards we apply the effects that I need. And there I can chain the effects, right? So this is, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, we created our both uh, effects, the inner shadow and the drop shadow. And okay, it's not in here. Uh, did I apply it somewhere? Oh, it's here, glow on set effect glow. Glow on was the stack pane for the on state, right? So I first apply the CSS style to the on shape and then I apply the effects. And with this means I can do the shapes in code or in CSS, I can create fill and stroke in code or CSS, single effects in CSS and effect chaining in code. So you can really mix it up, but uh, be careful because it's hard to support. And then uh, at last I would just like to show you a possible workflow, which is uh, my workflow at the moment. It's, I create a prototype of something like this. I use uh, Adobe Fireworks to do that. You can also use Illustrator, Photoshop, whatever. Vector drawing programs are best. And uh, I just arranged it that they, the layers are, you see it's a LED on, LED off, frame, highlight, and here we have the shapes with their names. I save it in layers because we stack them on top of each other. Then I create an FX, so-called FXG file, which is Flash XML Graphics, I think. It's a format made by Adobe. And I, I wrote a little tool, which is called FXG Converter, and then I can drag drop the stuff, this FXG file on the converter, and convert it into, for example, a JavaFX control here. And the output is something like that. So it gives me an LED the skin, the behavior, the CSS, and the builder class for that control. And um, what you can do with this, I will show you. This is the result, but what I would like to, but what I would like to show you is something different. It's, for example, this, if it works. I hope so. Does it show up? Here we go. Yeah, something like this you can do. Uh, this is, uh, all of these elements are custom controls that I created. By the way, part of the JF Extras project, which you should take a look at um, to learn something or to commit something into it. And uh, what you see is we have controls with animations and uh, we have, there's the LED on the left side. So in all of each character is a, a custom control. And th stuff like that is very easy doable. Yes? Do you have to write for this block or are there <laughs> Oh, it, it, it looks similar to the, the, it looks similar to the clock of the Deutsche Bahn, right? And uh, yeah, no, I don't have any right for that. <laughs> But it's open source and I just copy it, right? I just make a picture and draw it and it, it looks similar. It's not the same. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's worth a book, right? Yeah, um, Jonathan, you look like you can give a book to this uh, nice gentleman over there who reminds me on this uh, legal thing. <laughs> yeah, this is just something I would like to show you. And uh, later on I will also show you stuff running on the, on the Beagle board and also some custom controls. Okay, I'm, I, I said I'm really in a hurry and I think I'm, I'm done here. So I'm done here. So if you have uh, questions, I would be really happy to answer them. Any questions? Anyone who would like to have a book? Yes, over there. Yes, you have a shadow builder. You can really try for each object in the JavaFX API. Just try first if there's a, a builder. Most of the times there's one. And then it's very easy, especially yeah, things yeah. like uh, shadows and that stuff, very easy to create. Anything else? If you have questions, yeah, over there. Mm, you can do different things. Can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, um, the question was that uh, he was searching for an off-screen buffer where he can render something in the background and then blit it to the screen, right? 
Yeah, so you can use, for example, um, a writable image for that, to do that, but this is pixel-based. It depends on what you would like to do. You can also uh, use the canvas gauge, a uh, canvas node, which is something that you can, uh, it's like an uh, immediate draw node. That means you have a node and then you can draw something in it, like a paint component or paint in a swing. This is the same in the canvas node. And it's uh, based on the uh, canvas spec of HTML5. So that means if you know canvas in HTML5, you can code canvas in JavaFX. You can use that too. And I think we are, uh, the time is over, but if you have questions, I will be around the whole week and Jim too, so if you have questions, just ask us if you see us. Very good, well thank you, Garrett. Um, yeah. We've got, uh, we're gonna do a 15 minute break here. We're gonna uh, reconvene promptly at uh, 2.45, and then uh, uh, Parsico and Martin Gunnarsson are gonna talk about JavaFX.